Let's turn then in our Bibles to the 12th chapter of the Gospel of Luke. Today I'll be reading from verse 22 all the way down to verse 40. Luke chapter 12, beginning at verse 22. Then he, that is Jesus, said to his disciples, Therefore I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you shall eat, or what, or nor about the body, what you shall put on. Life is more than food, and the body more than clothing. Consider the ravens, for they neither sow nor reap, which neither store have neither storehouses nor barns, but God feeds them. How much more value are you than the birds? And which of you, by worrying, can, can add one cubit to his stature? If, then, you are not able to do the least of these things, why be anxious for the rest? Consider the lilies, how they grow they neither toil nor spin, yet I say to you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. If then God so clothes the grass, which today is in the field and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, how much more will he clothe you, O you of little faith? And do not seek what you should eat or what you should drink or nor have an anxious mind. For all these things the nations of the world seek after. And your Father knows what you need, that you need these things. But seek the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added to you. Do not fear, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Sell what you have and give alms. Provide for yourselves money bags which do not grow old, a treasure in heaven, in the heavens that does not fail, where no thief approaches nor moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there your heart will also be. Let your waist be girded and your lamps burning. And you yourselves be like men who wait for their master when he will return from the wedding, that when he comes and knocks, that they may open to him immediately. Blessed are those servants whom the master, when he comes, will find watching. Assuredly, I say to you he, that he will gird himself and have them sit down to eat. And will come and serve them. And if he should come in the second watch. Or come in the third watch. And find them so blessed are those servants. But know this. That if the master of the house had known the hour the thief would come. He would have watched. And not allowed his house to be broken into. Therefore you also be ready. For the Son of Man is coming at the, an hour when you do not expect. Amen. Uh, today we're in verse 22, all the way down. We'll see how far we can go. Jesus is talking to his disciples. He's teaching them in the face of this big crowd. After this uh, confrontation with the Pharisee in the Pharisee's house at that meal where things got a little bit hot, a little bit a little bit tense. And Jesus coming out, he then warns his disciples about the influence of religion, the influence of the intimidation of religion. You know, as I was preparing this this week, I, it came to my mind, gosh, that's always a diff, diff, dangerous thing to say, of the, the correlation or how this parallels almost the the parable of the sower or the, of, or the soils where Jesus tell, talks about the seed that is caught, cast into the, uh, the, on the path and the birds come and take it away. The, the, the seed that is sown in the stony ground that shoots up almost immediately but then when you know, uh, the sun comes out it withers away. And the, 
seed that is cast into the thorny ground grows up with the thorns, choke the life out of it, and then finally that which is cast into the good earth grows up and bears much fruit. Jesus explains this parable as the first one, those people with hard hearts, so that there is no receiving of the word, and the devil is able to come and take it away. The second being that of those who hear the word, receive it, and there is an immediate and joyful response, an emotional response. But yet when difficulties come, persecutions, hardness, sacrifice, their commitment or their response withers as quick as it grew. It vanishes. The third then being that which falls amongst the thorns, Jesus said, this is those who hear the word respond, it grows up, but the cares and temptations of this life choke the life out of it. It never grows up to bear fruit. It grows but is stunted and the things of this life become more important to them than the things of the kingdom. Those who hear the word but are seduced, fall away, are carried away by the lusts of the flesh and the things of this life. And Again, as I was going through these, these warnings of Jesus, I, I saw a kind of parallel. The first being those whose hearts are so hard that there is no room for the Christ and his kingdom who outwardly give the impression of goodness and, uh, and an openness, but their hearts are hard like the Pharisees. There's no, there's no room for real life there. They still have a stony heart. And I thought, well, that isn't that like the, the, the seed that falls upon the path? Hypocrisy is a knowing what's true but not doing it, knowing what you should do, giving the impression you're doing it, but inwardly you're not. There's a deadness there. And then the second one was, Jesus teaches, about, teaches, teaches the fear of God over the fear of man. How that these people, he warns his church about, again, he says in the positive first, that we should fear God more than we should fear men. Why was he saying that? Because he understood that his disciples were about to go through intense persecution. That we're not to be those who just simply receive the word and are joyful and happy to some um, on an emotional level, there has to be a depth, a reality. There must be roots to our faith. And Jesus warns his disciples about a kind of faith that hides, that gets intimidated, that puts a basket over itself, as it were. He warns his church about intimidated religion. And indeed, he warns them, if you are embarrassed about me in front of men, I will deny you. I will be embarrassed. I think that's a terrible thought, isn't it? If you're embarrassed about me in front of men, Jesus is literally saying, I will be embarrassed about you in front of the angels of God on that last day. Ashamed. He tells then about the parable of the rich fool. And this, where we are today in 22, fits neatly into that he talks about the materialism of the age of of falling into the temptation of trusting in riches the temptation of trying to build wealth for yourself of having a a uh, martin lloyd jones in his um commentary on the sermon on the mount calls it a divided mind the sacred the non-sacred, God, church, Jesus, but my life here too. Again, Martin Lloyd-Jones in his commentary on the Sermon on the Mount says, here Jesus is talking to his disciples about the single-mindedness of the Christian life. All things, whether eat or drink, everything we do must be to the glory of God. And here in this passage, he, he begins to, I want to use the word rebuke, 
exhort, maybe is a better word, exhort his disciples not to be anxious. Now, if you know me in the year that I've had, this was a, a very a convicting message for me and myself. He says there, therefore I say to you, do not worry about your life. The word worry there means to be anxious. Or one of the, the, the transliterations was to be doubtfully minded. The word here is used when Jesus is talking to Mary and Martha. We all know that story. I know you know it. When Jesus is having dinner in Mary and Martha's house. And uh, he's teaching there and Mary's sitting by his feet and Martha's running here and Martha's running there and she's doing everything. And Martha gets really annoyed with her sister and he com she comes to Jesus and she says, Lord, tell her to get up and do something. And Jesus rebukes Martha and says, Martha, you're concerned, worried about many things. She is only concerned about, she's chosen the better and the word there, to be concerned, is the same word that's used here. It means to have uh, many minds. To be thinking about many things. You're concerned about many things. To be doubtfully minded. Again, Martin Lloyd-Jones in his commentary says it is to be doubly minded. To be split in your concerns. To be more focused on other things. To allow like a rainbow of concerns to be in front of you. Jesus is commanding. And I love this because when I was looking at it, it's not a suggestion. That's why I'm, I'm, I'm hard pressed here to say rebuke, exhortation. It's a command. <gasps> Jesus is not saying, listen, as much as possible that you can do it, as far as you're able, don't worry. Do not worry. It's right up there with, you shall not kill. You shall not steal. You shall not commit adultery. Jesus then says, do not worry. find that really challenging. Now what is he telling his disciples not to worry about? Do not worry about your life. And then he splits it, explains what he means, what you will eat. Or about the body, what you will put on. Now this is not giving those of us who have a bit of a, a shapely shape that we don't have to exercise or you know, I don't, I don't have to diet. It's not about that unfortunately. Here, Jesus is talking about the, the basic building blocks of life. In life, we need two things, don't we? we what we eat, and we need shelter. A place to be in, a covering. And in the ancient world, much more than today here in Finland, where we're all well off and blessed, people were hard-pressed to find, where, what are we going to feed our kids today? What are we going to have to eat tomorrow? Where am I going to get the finances to keep the roof over our head for next week or next month? They weren't just living from paycheck to paycheck, monthly paycheck to monthly. They were living from day to day, hour to hour. And, and so they had much more of a concern than perhaps you and I would have. And yet Jesus lays down this command, you shall not worry. Be doubly minded. Be so overly concerned that the only thing that is in your mind is the concern about what am I going to do here? What am I going to do there? I don't know about yourselves, but when I get concerned, it either leads to, to lots of actions trying to do as much as possible. Or, to be honest, it paralyzes. You don't know really what to do. You have all these opportunities and, or open doors or things that you could or should do. And yet, oftentimes, we become paralyzed with indecision, with an insecurity. We don't know what's best. And therefore, we get paralyzed. 
we start to drag our feet and become full of fear. That's why worry and fear are joined together. Here in this passage, he's commanding them not to fear. Why? Because fear is the expression of unbelief. Anxiety, concern. It's saying, I don't believe God is able. It's having an incomplete view of the sovereignty, sovereignty, the all powerfulness of God. (laughs) Christ knows his little band of followers, he knows them intimately, he knows his church. In the future sense, intimately, he knows your heart and my heart intimately. And he knows the concerns which are ordinary and natural to all men through all times, no matter where you're from. Whether you're from Ireland or Africa, whether you're from Sweden or Finland, whether you're from states or wherever you're from, these concerns are all natural to man. It's not a cultural thing. It's not a historical thing. It's a human thing. And he commands, and I love it, straight out of the bat, doesn't mess around with words. Jesus was the greatest teacher ever to live. And he just says, don't be concerned about what you're going to eat, what you're going to put on. And then he breaks it down. For life is more than food and the body more than clothing. And he draws this lovely picture. In Matthew, it says the birds. Here, it says the ravens. For they neither sow nor reap, neither have storehouses nor barns, but God feeds them. How much more value are you than the birds? Now, there's things here to to notice. Again, Lord Jones, whom I've taken great help from this week, points out this. Jesus is not saying that we are to be lazy. He's not saying here that we're to be inactive. Who's ever seen the little birds in their garden? My father-in-law loves the little birds. Old people love little birds. We all know this. And they put the bird feeders in their garden. My, my father-in-law has tons both sides of the house. Wherever, there, wherever there's a window, there's a bird feeder outside it. He can even tell you, so he says, individual birds. I'm hard-pressed to believe that. But apparently he can. And when you're sitting there at the coffee table with your coffee, seeing all these talioxen and, and blomes and, and uh, the, what are, dumherre, what's that in English? Bullfinches, thank you, Don. Green finches and all the rest. And they're all swarming, eating the, the, the seeds and picking them off the ground. They're not sitting around being inactive. You see them, they fly down, they take a seed, they fly back up to a perch somewhere. They take the, you know, they peel it off, they eat it, and then they fly back down and they pick it up and they go up. If you look at the the, the birds of the field who are out there, uh, they fly, they land, they walk around looking for the food. You see their heads coming back up and down. They don't sit there waiting for a truck to drive to them, do they? They don't look up to heaven and say, okay, Lord, I'm right here, right now. Bring on the food. They don't do that. Yet God provides for them. He gives them opportunity. Indeed, Calvin is wonderful on this. Calvin is like, you know, this is great uh, incentive for us to go out and make our fortunes. That God has given us all opportunities. There is God-given opportunities out there just for you to go and take if you are willing. Calvin's very cool. But we are to consider the birds. The birds don't sit on the trees, on the branches, or on the and 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 shake and worry and fear. Oh my goodness, what am I going to do? Where am I going to find food? God provides food for them. They seek it, they find it, they are alive. And Jesus then says, now you've considered that, 
Do you thank God who provides food for these birds? Look out your bird feeder. Look out in the fields. Look at the ducks on the water. People throwing bread at them and stuff. I don't know. If God provides for them, how much more will he provide for you who love him? Of whom he has, he has bought. And we're talking about all the people who are those whom God has invested in. Will he not provide for you? Do you have a case to be anxious? Here Jesus is boistering up, holding up the people's faith high by lifting up God and his character. If he is able to provide for the birds, the uh, tons and tons, I don't know how, multitude of birds out there, all with different food needs and whatever else, he provides for them. How much more will he provide for you? As you seek, you will find. As you ask, you will receive. As you <laughs> knock upon that door, that door will be opened to you. And which of you, by worrying, can add one cubit to his stature? Let me tell you, as a small man, you cannot add to your stature. I cannot push the centimeters out. I am as God has made me. And he's using this, I think it was probably a, a, a humorous, he probably was pointing at somebody, Zacharias, who was tiny, when he said this. We have not the ability to change the physical things about ourselves, our height. And Michael Jackson, for all of his wickedness, changed his physical appearance. But he was still Michael Jackson with all of his wickedness. We cannot change who we are. We can maybe lose a bit of weight, and cut our hair, put makeup on, grow a beard. But we, we cannot change who we are. And because of that unchanging fact, why, why, why be concerned? Why be worried? Why be worried about things you have no power over? Trust God. He then flows to the lilies, verse 27. How, consider how they grow. Uh, one of the nicest things I like to do is walk down the country lane when all the flowers are out. You know, sometimes you get almost choked by the pollen, you know. Soon it'll be the Björk pollen season now, and then some of us will be choked and killed and murdered. But you see the flowers coming out. Beautiful. I mean, you, if you go in, some people, there's a lady in, in, in Essie who has this beautiful garden with all these exotic, beautiful flowers, storm hat them, whatever they're called. They're beautiful. Blue and they have like lightning flashes throughout the flower, not like bright, you know, but they're, that's what they're called, lightning flashes throughout the flower absolutely beautiful and and wonderful and god provides for covering for the plants how much more will he provide for us he will care for his children in a true and real sense and once again he's putting us in a position where we are forced to look at the providence of god and of god's provision for nature and if God can provide for not just a garden or a field or a forest, but indeed for the entire world, how much more will he be able to provide for you and I in our small lives? He is illustrating to us the foolishness of our fear, of our anxious minds, of our doubt, and of our worry. How we have a small God in our mind. How we need to have a big God in our mind. One who is able and willing to provide for his children. He says there, 
if this is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is today or here today and gone tomorrow, basically, how much more will he clothe you, oh, you of little faith? I think this is really interesting. The disciples had Jesus with them. I mean, Jesus was right there. They saw all the healings and miracles, the signs and wonders and tremendous, like, deliverances from demonic spirits. And yet they were of little faith. How much more harder must it be for us who have not seen? How much more must we battle with these things? Not just the, 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 the concern about earthly needs and, and desires, but with hypocrisy, with the fear of man, with fear of, 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 of the intimidation of the world. How, how little must our faith be? And how much more must we need him to help us to not be fearful and afraid, not to be a hypocrite, that we must seek his strength all the more. When we are fearful and worry, we demonstrate how little our faith is. That's very awakening. And I'm not talking just about church stuff, but in anything in our lives. What am I going to do next year? I'm not saying don't think about it. But there's a difference between thinking about something and becoming fearful about worrying. You know, you know what the word worry means? Where it gets its, its uh, I want to say, its beginning from. I can't remember how you say it in English. To worry means to to. Move something back and forward to, to try and work it loose. You're twisting it so much that eventually, boop, you've pulled it off. It means to worry. Or it's like a, the, one of the other means is when a dog has something in its mouth and he's pulling at it. Arr, I, I don't know if, how, if you know how dogs, cats have like scissor teeth. So when a cat bites something, it just just cuts it in half. A dog does not have those kind of teeth. Dogs have hold-on teeth and strong neck muscles, so they must pull like a crocodile. They pull lumps of flesh off. They worry free big lumps of flesh, which they then chomp down. Okay? Excuse the horrible illustration there. Very Silence of the Lambs. <laughs> but when we worry we are literally moving something back and forth in our mind and we are commanded by the scriptures not to, to be those kind of people who are worrying going back and forth back and forth back and forth we are commanded to be at peace in our mind to not to be fearful but to be bold and full of courage. Jesus then tells us that not only... Oh, sorry, verse 29. I don't want to go to 30, 31 first. Verse 29. And do not seek what you should eat or what you should drink, or, or nor have an anxious mind. Of course, he's talking to the Jewish people here, the Jewish disciples who are um, guided by their um, eating and drinking laws, what was clean, what wasn't clean. The Pharisees had taken that to a hyper level so that even if you were to buy clean food from the market, if it had been in the omrod, in the, the area of an unclean person, was the food, the clean food, then contaminated? The, the wine or the water that you were drinking, they didn't really drink water, they drank like diluted wine. If, if you had bought that from a, a, a clean seller, but where were the grapes from? And who was it who picked the grapes? Was he a Gentile? Did he contaminate? Just foolishness and ridiculousness. And so they were concerned about the most inconsequential things. And Jesus is telling them, don't get caught up in all of this nonsense. Don't get caught up 
in the, the need to know all the minutiae and details of it and to be concerned that you're sinning or you're falling away or, or that it's good for you or not good for you. Do not be anxious of mind. He says in verse 30, For all these things the nations of the world seek after. Your Father knows what you need, that you need these things. How often do we as Christians behave just like the people of this world? That we as believers behave like unbelievers? Sometimes it even seems like unbelievers are, in their ignorance, are more confident and fearless than we are. With all our light, with all of our confidence in God. Sometimes, you know, I've seen it many times, that you'll, you'll have an unbeliever come and maybe try and counsel a believer because the believer is so fearful, so paralyzed, so depressed about their life, their consequences, whatever. And yet Jesus is saying here, people, don't behave like the people of this world. He, he's not saying not be active. He's not saying don't try, work hard, provide for your family. He's not saying be inactive. He's saying don't worry, but just trust that as you move forward, God will open up opportunities for you and provide for you. All too often we have a theoretical God. We don't have a living and true God. I, I think of a good example of this that when I was working in the factory and there was the, the 2008 crisis when everybody was put on permitting. I don't know what that is in English. Okay? No, it's not furlough. It's you're getting laid off. I think it's in English. Redundancy. Redundancy. Thank you, Don. Furlough is like a holiday. Okay? Because when a minister goes on furlough, he doesn't go get fired from his job and then have to be rehired. Um... And all the people from the union were all like, Phew, it's a really good job that we're, we're in the union. And I didn't belong to the union because I objected to several of the things that were going on in the union. And so the people in the union were like, ha, 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 ha. What are you going to do? Because you're not part of the union. And I said, you know, thank God I have God who's got my back. And they were like, Pfft. And then it, ultimately in the end, Every other member of the factory got put on redundancy, permitting, except your man here. And I went and asked the boss and said, why? And he says, oh, just because the cars just fell that way. And, uh, you know, you work hard and you don't have a problem with you. And, you know, just was just, just turned out everybody else we could lay off. But, you know, you, just, you were the right guy for the right time. We didn't have a problem. You could stay on. And I thought... God makes a way. And I have to tell you, I was not afraid nor worried nor afraid of how I was going to make ends meet because I was trusting in God to provide a way. And he did. I didn't have to go to the, my boss. I didn't have to blackmail or, or intimidate or beg. God just opened up a door. He sustained and held us. And during that crisis, of all the people in the factory, the only person that they didn't lay off at that time was yourself and myself here. God keeps his people. But we are to behave not like the people of this world, being anxious and worried, having to talk with everybody and tell everybody and, 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 and then buy our nails and pull our hair out and get fat. We are to be the, the, the people who walk around confident and bold and fearless. Not foolish. Not, not clown-like and, and ridiculous. But demonstrating our confidence in our Father that He has got our back. That He will provide for us. We are not to be like the people of this world. We're to be different. We're not to be many-minded People who are so caught up with just 
worldly things, trying to build an empire for ourselves or overreach ourselves, be so concerned about our financial status. Again, Lloyd-Jones, in his commentary on the Sermon on the Mount, says about this, it is the risk of becoming idolatrous in our mind towards financial and material things. When we so put when we put so much worth on the things of this world, on our position, on our bank account, on our reputation, that we forget about God. We put him on a lower level. He's really there to serve our need, but really that's about it. That's very challenging. Because as Calvin said, the human heart is an idol-making factory. We always are running the risk of, of producing idols. And financial security, financial stability can be one of those idols. Indeed, if there's any criticism that we could ever point at the Puritan movement post-Cromwell, is that they were a very materialistic movement. The Lord blessed them seemingly. The, 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 the methods in that they, and the means that they used that were biblical prospered them, but they became intensely focused upon their wealth. And many of them became extremely wealthy. The min minority that, were, that controlled the majority Many believe that this is ultimately what brought down the Puritan movement was their concern about worldly wealth. Beloved, you and I, we need to know that God knows what we need. We have kids. We, we care for our kids, our babies, our children. When they need clothes, we buy them. When they need, and you'll learn this, when they need fed, we feed them. When they need their butts changed, we change their butts. Not anymore, thank God. But um, we care and cater for them. We, we, we allow them to live in our houses and make messes, and, and we still pay for them. If we who are earthly parents know how to do that, how much more will our heavenly Father, who has paid such a great price for us, I have natural children, but I am not a natural child of God. He had to pay a price beyond price for me. He's not going to allow that investment to be wasted. I need to trust in him and his nature, and I need not worry. Beloved, it is not a suggestion. It is a commandment. We are not to be so worldly minded, so caught up in the things of this life, in the temptations and the stresses and the strains, that the fruit of our life be twisted and strangled and eventually killed. It has been my sad experience that Many of the young men that I went to Bible college with who came, went into the ministry much quicker than I did, almost directly after Bible college, only one or two of those young men of, of a group of maybe 15 are still in the ministry. They were all much better than me in their studies, all much more pious and holy and right. But unfortunately, the things, when I look at many of them, those whom I know a little bit better than, than some of the others, the things of this life, the concerns and the fears of financial struggles kill them. Well, kill their faith, should I say. And now, today, they are no longer ministers in the church, no longer working in a, in a setting like this. They have gone into business. One dear brother whom I know and love he works on an oil rig. He was one of the greatest evangelists that I'd ever met. And now, 
has no time for church, no time for, he makes more for one month on an oil rig than he did for six months in the pulpit. In verse 31, Jesus gives the action. Don't worry. Don't strive. Don't strain. He's not saying be inactive. He then tells us what to do. But seek the kingdom of God. And all these things shall be added to you. Seek God's glory. Add to his kingdom. The, the building up of his people. Invest yourself in God's work. In seeking to glorify him. Firstly, chiefly in ourselves and then our family and then in our church community and then in the community in which our church community is within and then in a nationwide sense. Invest yourself in God and in God's kingdom. Don't hold back. And I like this because it's a single-minded action. Give yourself wholeheartedly to this. He's not saying give up your jobs or give up your other interests, but chiefly, primarily, first in your life comes Christ and his kingdom. That in all things that you do, God should be glorified. No fear, no worry. No anxiety, no double-minded, no doubtful-mindedness. Single-minded passion and purpose. A wholehearted devotion. An all-in spirit. That you are building, adding, constructing, trusting, participating in that you desire that God would be glorified, that all that is his would go to him in every aspect of your life, that you won't have the, the secular and the sacred. Beloved, we are Baptists. We do not believe in the secular and the sacred. All things work together, whether we eating or drinking whether we're standing or sitting, whether we're alive or dead, all things to the glory of God. Your life as an example of his glory, don't be lost. Don't be confused. Don't be so taken up with the things of this world that you are sidetracked. Don't be so caught up in the concerns of this life that Christ and his kingdom begin to lose importance. That you, you get further and further away. I'm just so busy in my life right now. I don't have time for you, Christ. Lord, as soon as I get this done, I'm your man. Lord, or, you know, it gets to that point when we don't even consider God in our choices. He's not part of what we're doing. What we're doing, we're like, oh, you can say, oh, yeah, to God be the glory. But he hasn't even, you haven't prayed about your decision. You haven't asked for blessing or permission. Just go ahead and do whatever you do. Live your life and God just takes the rest. The scraps. Beloved, you are commanded not to worry, to be anxious. You're not to be taken up with the things of this life. Not to be so materialistically minded, so worldly minded that heaven has no place in your heart. I love that Jesus says here in verse 32, do not fear, little flock. Don't be afraid. But it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. I wish we believed that. 
I wish we, we lived in that reality. I wish I lived in that reality. We must endeavor to live in that reality. We must fight against our fear. We must cry out to God to deliver us from it. We must trust in the unchanging plans of the Father. That God has a purpose and a plan and that is being fulfilled in our experience. We are not an accident. We are not some sort of hostage at the mercy of our circumstances. God is in control and he is moving forward and our lives are the unfolding of that plan. Whether you and I are aware of it does not matter. See, all too often we want to be the heroes of our own story. We want to be the, the, the star at the center of the movie. You know, you watch a movie. The boys and I, my little boys and I watched The Last Jedi. Is that what it was? Last, the last Star Wars film. I can't remember which one it is. The one with Ray and all those other people. I don't know. Anyway, terrible. All too often, we want to be the hero of our own story. And we want the, the movie to be about us. We want them to write books about us. Not necessarily we put it, articulate that way. But we live in such a self-centered age. We've been fed on movies and on books that are all about the person that we forget that as Christians, we are not about ourselves. Our lives are to revolve around him. That is the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the hero of the story. He is the movie star. He is the one. And we are just all extras helping his story along. We, we need them to realize that, to live in that truth, that God's plans are so that he will one day sit upon David's throne in a physical and real sense, and we will all sit by before him. Every knee shall bow, every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Do not fear, little flock. And then he says in verse 33, sell what you have and give alms. Provide for yourselves money bags which do not grow old. A treasure in heavens that does not feel where no thief can approach nor moth destroy. For where your treasure is, there is your heart also. My beloved, he's not saying we should live like hermits. That we should be like Franciscan monks. I personally love France. Francis of Assisi, I don't know if you all know this, but I, I have a man crush on him. You know, I know there was a lot wrong with him, but I like Francis of Assisi. I wrote my thesis on Francis of Assisi, okay? There's a lot wrong with him, I do know that. But I just, I really like Francis of Assisi. And they, they loved these verses. They were all about give up everything and, you know. But it's not about that, it's no sidetracking, no history lessons. It's about living in the truth that this life is a temporary life. That you, no matter how much you save up, how much you have in the bank, you will one day die. This life will be over. Whatever's in your bank account will be divided up amongst your um, heirs. Thank you very much. And, uh, and then the government will tax you. Sorry, Daniel. They will. They will tax you on your inheritance. Okay? And the money that you have worked hard all your life to amass for yourself will be taken off you and given to others and the state will then steal money from your followers, not followers, uh, inheritors, whatever that is. Yes. But the wealth and the riches that we amass in Christ, no one will ever be able to take that away from us. Those good deeds, those acts of mercy, those opportunities of obedience, those rewards that we earn before God, 
Jesus encourages us not to be so concerned with this life now, but rather provide for the life that is to come. You will one day die, or Christ will be returning. Game over. You will one day die, and all of your struggles, and all of your strains, and all of your worries will fade away. Like a snowflake melting in the sun. And you will understand the reality. The foolishness of all of that stressing and strain. That depression and anguish. All of that worldly ambition. You will realize the foolishness of it all. It would be terrible. To have worked hard and to be rich in this life and to live 80 years, however long you're going to live, Joel, maybe 100 and something. And then as you step into the next life, to be as a pauper, a poor man in that life that is to come because of a a heart that has been so self-centered, a heart that has been so Christless, if you can be that in a Christian, and, and I think you can. You can be saved, but you can be so miserly in your commitment to Christ. Beloved, we are commanded here not to worry. We are commanded here not to fear. We are commanded here to seek the kingdom of God. We are commanded here to do good works, to provide for ourselves treasure in heaven. And Jesus ends the section in this, for where your treasure is, there your heart will also be. I think that's really telling. If you want to know where a person's value system is, what they're really about, look what they give themselves to. What do they invest their time, their effort? What do they talk about? Where is their heart? How do you know that? Well, what do they treasure the most in this life? What are they working hardest to achieve? Are they giving their life to Christ and to the, to the work of his church, to, to the body? I know many Christian men who have given their lives to the ministry. Kyle, Kyle Ministries. That's wrong. Well, let's give our hearts our whole heart, our, 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 our whole being to the work of Christ. Let him be our treasure. Let him be our fortune. Let us work hard to earn him. And I don't mean salvation, but Jesus warns us. Where is your heart? What is your treasure? If we were to be able to examine your life and do an audit of your life, where would your time be invested? Where would your mental powers be so focused on? Would you, like me, have spent a year fussing and fretting and being afraid? Being distracted and and worrying about things you cannot change and have no ability to influence? Or are you one of those kind of other people who don't even concern yourselves about things but just are so focused on what you want? Single-minded in your pursuit of material things that Christ and his kingdom has peeled in the past and you don't know, you don't hear, you don't see, you don't notice. Me, my, and I. Oh, beloved. Let us hear what Christ has to say to the church. We, we encourage, don't be, don't be hypocrites. Don't be afraid of men. Don't be intimidated. Don't be a coward. Don't be materialistic. Don't be a man or a woman whose all they're about is their career and their life here on earth and amassing for themselves a fortune and fame. And, and, and don't be an anxious person. Don't be a person of many minds. 
of doubtful thinking, of a fearful heart. A person so obsessed with the moment. Me, my, and I. These are the greatest dangers to the church. Jesus is not talking to the world, to the multitude around him. He is telling these things to his followers. To the twelve, to the little group of church that was around him, his little flock. But also down through the ages, through the power of the Holy Spirit to you and to me. You and I fit in these categories. And you and I need to guard our hearts from the influence of the world, the flesh, and the devil who will seek to divide us from Christ, to draw us away, to cause us to hide as Adam hid at the calling of the Lord in the garden. Adam, Adam, what did Adam do? He hid, didn't he? All too often you and I, beloved, behave like Adam, hide behind our curves and our concerns and our worldly desires. You are commanded not to be worried, anxious. Let's pray. Our Lord and Heavenly Father, we know that you are almighty and powerful. We know, Lord, that you are in control of all things. Father, we see by the light of your word how far short we often fall we are thoroughly grateful for your teaching we are thoroughly grateful lord for your expertise and your warnings and your commands lord help us to be obedient lord as we are obedient to the command not to steal and the command not to lie and the command not to be uh, to worship foreign gods or to murder or to uh, covet that which is not ours. Lord, help us to be obedient to the command of not to be anxious in our mind over anything. Not to be so overcome by the concerns about our careers or our, the house that we live in or the clothes that we wear or the food that we eat, Lord, or the body in which we inhabit. Help us, O oh God, to not to be worldly-minded, but to be heavenly-minded. Lord, we are grateful for the knowledge that as we live our lives and pursue, Lord, our careers and our jobs and, and just the, the opportunities that are out there, we know the Lord, you'll provide for us, that we have, Lord, your support, and that you know what we need, and you'll provide it for us. Lord, we are grateful. We are grateful that we have confidence in you that you are the true and real and living God and are active in our lives Lord and are, are more influential in our lives than we are Lord we confess that we have worried and have been anxious and concerned about things we cannot change and have no influence over Lord we have sinned against you and we apologize and repent Lord oh God help us Lord, help us to be obedient. Help us, O oh God, in our new nature, not to worry or to be afraid, not to be so distracted or come under the influence of the devil, that, Lord, that the fruit of our lives would be choked and strangled and murdered. O oh God, bring glory to your name. Bring glory to your name, we pray. We ask this for your glory and your glory alone. In Jesus' precious name, amen.